Right, thank you guys. Uh, so I'll try to cover some of the bit more details on the product and then Nick is going to do on a whiteboard, uh, go into a bit more details of how the data is actually laid out, how it gets spread, <coughs> how our failure handling is uh, you know, handled in the system, how do we scale the system, how data movement happens, et cetera. And, and the bill is going to wrap it up with a number of demos. All the proof points that we talk about, he's going to kind of show it in real demos. Hopefully, we'll have enough time to go through the whole long list that he has. Um, <clears throat> so just to kind of double click, I mean, continue from what Mark talked about. The key thing, what we've seen from companies which are building clouds are, A, you know, they want to defragment the data center or bust the silos. You know, historically, they had these project-based silos, and there are a lot of good storage systems for these specific projects. But they all want to have the blueprint of uh, Amazon or a Google or a Azure, and that's uh, a shared infrastructure which can have multiple applications on one, in one shared environment. Uh, key thing, other key thing people move to the public cloud, or any cloud for that matter, is the agility. They just want to spin up the next container or next VM without waiting for days or weeks or months. Uh, and, and, and the idea is to keep adding the infrastructure. You don't have one point solution for one point application, but you have this common infrastructure which can be tweaked for your application with, with different service levels, right? Uh, the third aspect is about operational efficiency. You cannot build clouds and operate clouds at scale if you have to scale human resources to the number of you know, boxes or number of racks or number of storage systems you have, right? And storage is unfortunately probably the more human heavy aspect in this whole operation. So uh, whenever we talk about managing the product, it's all about operations offload, and we truly mean that. So we have a combination of edge computing on the cluster itself, which determines you know, how the resources are placed very effectively. Nick is gonna talk about that specific case. And then we move uh, some of the long tail analytics, we call this the, the cloud part of it, where we build insights and some kind of predictive notions and in, enforce it back into the environment. So that's, that's a big aspect for us. We, we think long term, obviously, performance, speeds, and feeds are going to be relevant, but more important is going to be the operational aspect of the system itself. The, third, <clears throat> the, the, the dovetail tail of that is I talked about you, know, you want to bust the silos and you have a common shared infrastructure. You don't want to compromise the services you give to each of these applications. You want to have an environment where uh, you, could, you could offer the right services for the right applications. And uh, we'll, again, go through a specific demo and specific cases where you don't have to compromise your high performance you know, OLTP workload to a long tail big data workload and, and, and the like. And, and we mean that in its true sense, not just performance, but also price. And that's one of the unique aspects we have, right? We, we take advantage of this, this wide spectrum of media available, and from hard drives to cheap flash to expensive flash to some extremely expensive flash at some point of time, and start to arbitrage the capabilities of each of these media types to provide the right service levels. And, and last part of it is, is kind of achieving this automation. Uh, one thing is the system itself adapting and driving, but more importantly, when you're deploying you know, tens of instances of this application, Human error is one of the biggest problems. We all know that. So we have a very nice framework to automate uh, and scale these applications, right? So once you have, let's say, a blueprint for your MySQL production database, you can have all your production users just replicate that all over again. You don't have to give, uh, let everybody go and configure this. We have given a very nice template-ish scheme where you can go automate and deploy this, right? So it takes a lot of the error a factor in, in scaling applications, especially when you want to automate and when you want to make this very seamless uh, to scale. So, you know, the, the panache is obviously cloud operations and economics with enterprise capabilities and, uh, and performance. And, and we'll show all aspects of this in some fashion uh, in terms of performance, in terms of the capabilities and the like. Um, this is kind of a very high level view of the system and we'll double click on each aspect of it. So there is a component of the system which is on the premise and this part is on the premise and that part I grayed out, it's cloudy, that's in the cloud. Uh, the idea is um, the system itself is a scale-out distributed storage system. It runs on multiple types of media and multiple types of hardware configurations. You can have Dell, Supermicro, XYZ servers. You can have hybrid flash nodes, a combination of uh, NVMe flash and hard drives and all flash nodes, and maybe tomorrow very sophisticated flash nodes. The idea is we're really agnostic to the type of you know, uh, servers and the media you're running. Uh, the, 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 when, when we add these nodes, they're kind of self-describing. We have agents which go and monitor and kind of advertise the capabilities of the system into the cluster, and we treat that as a, as a pool of uh, 
capacity and performance files, and, and we kind of arbitrage uh, based on the application requirements. The, <clears throat> the second part of it is, uh, I think in terms of connectivity, um, we, we have nothing exotic. It's uh, 10 gig, 40 gig, 25 gig, 50 gig, 100 gig, doesn't matter what, uh, you know, what the speed and feed is. Uh, Ethernet-based fabric, so we have the ability to have a front-end network connecting to the clients itself, iSCSI connectivity, uh, as well as the independent back-end connectivity, or you know, some customers who want to share the network, and that's possible as well, so we're extremely flexible from a networking perspective. So the bottom line is when we install the software, we discover the capabilities of that particular system and you know, do the appropriate partitioning of how the- Ashok, did you say the back-end network was in InfiniBand? No, it's all Ethernet. It's all Ethernet. Yeah, so our goal is that we don't want to dictate any new specifications as we enter the cloud. I mean, clouds these days are completely commodity x86 servers in Ethernet fabric, and we want to seamlessly fit into those environments. We are flexible on the speeds of the 10 gig, uh, sorry, the Ethernet fabric itself. Uh, typically, most of our customers are using a combination of 10 and 40, 10 gig on the front end and 40 on the back end. Uh, but again, Bill is going to do a demo with 25 and 50, uh, we, have, we have got a customer who's interested in 25 and 100. It's just about, you know, the price points of networking is coming uh, down, so it's, speeds are becoming less uh, of a problem. Yeah, and you'll see that uh, we translate a lot of these great, uh, should I say, performance benefits you get out of the network and the media to the application directly. So in our, in our performance run, you'll see super low latencies, uh, even for a large scale out cluster, and that's a, that's a kind of a key aspect we really want to you know, point out here. Um, I'll spend, uh, we'll also go through the, the cloud uh, operations portal. Uh, it is one environment uh, which is multi-customer, multi-cluster view. For, so every customer can log in and they can see their cluster, clusters view. Uh, from a support perspective, we can see a global view. We can log into every customer and figure out what's happening. Uh, it gives us really deep insights. Uh, I'll, I'll spend a bit more time towards the end talking about the capabilities and we'll go through live, go through environment, uh, local environment as well. <clears throat> yeah, so just on the level set, obviously we, like I talked about, we have enterprise capabilities, thin provisioning, um, zero head snapshots and clones, uh, volume placement, and, and that's one of the key aspects of our system. You can control very nicely how you want to arbitrage the, the media types you have in terms of price performance. We'll talk about that a bit more in detail and Nick is gonna double click on that. You can, we can do a lot of non-disruptive operations. You can uh, resize the configuration. You can add nodes, delete nodes, uh, et cetera, online without any impact. Um, we obviously have a number of classic features that you expect, compression, uh, replication, quality of service, and, and we'll kind of roll in a lot of this in the demo as well. Uh, Performance-wise, um, we can do like 70K IOPS uh, on per node basis, sub millisecond latency. In fact, we'll show like sub half a millisecond latency in our performance run right now. Uh, and this is with a 70-30 read-write ratio. So uh, it's a kind of fairly small block, uh, random 4K, <coughs> 4K 70, 30 read-write ratio. So, you know, fairly uh, the worst case, you know, I option. What, what kind of hardware are you, are you typically seeing your software run as? Is it just commodity like Dell servers or white box servers? What yeah, so it's super about? micro and Dell are the most common configurations we see at the customer sites. We ourselves, uh, if a customer wants to buy an appliance configuration from us, we ship a super micro 1U or a 2U configuration. The all flash nodes are on a 1U, uh, 10 drives, 10 two and a half inch SAS drives. Just 10 uh, gig ethernet off the 10 that. gig ethernet and 40 gig ethernet. So stand, nothing, nothing fancy about the servers itself. You said, or the, in, you said the flash drives are SAS drives? The flash drives are uh, SATA drives. SATA. It's not, there's no, it's not a hyper coverage. there's no hypervisor running on there, it's just storage. Uh, right? Yeah, it's just storage software. We are a Linux-based storage software, right? So we present iSCSI connectivity to the clients. All right, uh, and another goal, like I said, is we want to seamlessly fit into existing operations environment in, in the data center, right? Whether it's uh, operations monitoring tools, SLA monitoring tools like SNMP syslog or so derivatives of those tools. Or, or it could be orchestration tools, and, and we'll show you a demo where we have concurrent, operate, concurrent uh, orchestrators all kind of working off one cluster, right? You can have, uh, you know, you can have uh, VMware to OpenStack to the latest Kubernetes environments, container environments, all in one environment, and you can partition the resources appro appropriately with uh, tenancy and the like. So, you know, extremely flexible from that perspective as well. Um, 
Yeah, it's just to double click on the market space because we do want to differentiate ourselves from you know, classic storage space. Obviously, we're not going after the very low end of the mid-market space where it's very project driven and, and the capacity is you know, a terabyte or 10 terabyte kind of environments. We're definitely going after environments where they want to build clouds. Uh, you know, something like a 50 to 100 terabyte should be like usually the typical starting capacity of many of our customers. Usually it's a lot more than that, but you know, that's the typical capacity of uh, most of our environments. Our, our starting configuration is um, three plus one nodes. You know, three nodes is the minimum configuration for quorum of the, of the distributed system. And we recommend at least one additional node or two additional nodes if you want to have three nodes. Four, I'm sorry. Three plus one. Yeah, three is so, the minimum configuration to start with. We recommend at least one more, four nodes, in case to handle failures and the like, because that's one of the requirements in storage. People want reliability. Um, yeah. The more uh, the interesting part is the system gets. Ex you know, you add performance and capacity as you add nodes. So it's 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 very nice. It, you know, I think Bill will show you that as well as you add nodes you start to see you know very linear nice linear growth in performance and capacity um, and you know rebuilds and failure handling exponentially improves with with the scale of the cluster and nick is going to talk about that in particular right so it's that's one interesting part of distributed systems is unlike you know arrays where things break exponentially as it becomes as it becomes larger because the the failure domain becomes complicated here it things improve faster, rebuilds are faster, failure handling is better, everything is better as the cluster gets wider, bigger and bigger. The data resiliency based on RAID or erasure coding? Yeah, so we have a replication is one of the factor. And uh, so what we do is we control, we give you the ability to control what kind of replication factor you want to have on a per volume basis. So there are some customers who want to have nine, no, five nines or six nines. And based on the cluster size, we have a tool which can recommend what are the right replication factors they can have. We're extremely flexible from that perspective. And there are some applications where replication is maintained in the application. You know, you have a two-way, three-way Cassandra replica, doesn't need replication on the storage device itself, and your replication factor could be one on the storage system. That right. supports iSCSI, is that? Yes, we present iSCSI to the clients, yes. ISER, iSCSI. And Nick is, uh, Nick is going to talk about the framework itself, and he's the maintainer of the LIO um, stack. So all the protocols, uh, block protocols in the market for Linux, uh, offered by LIO, uh, offered by LIO, are were authored and upstreamed by Nick. Thank you, Nick. Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> the other aspect is, like we said, like I said earlier, obviously um, the classic enterprise capabilities are important, but I think more important uh, in the cloud, what's happening is this notion of flexibility, which is becoming uh, imperative, agility and flexibility. So uh, you can see that the the use cases we are going after are fairly large clouds, uh, advanced enterprises where they're building clouds themselves either to host their uh, dev environments or their own analytics environments and the like, uh, service providers, tier two, tier three service providers, uh, and digital businesses, uh, you know, SaaS companies and, and ad tech and FinTech companies. So they all, they all IT is a core expertise and competence of their, of their environments and they really want to uh, offer unique services to their uh, customers and that's, that's one of the values that we really provide. So for that, uh, the key tenants of our architecture are, you know, the elasticity in terms of how we scale and shrink. Uh, you know, surprisingly, customers care as much as shrinking as much as scaling, and we'll talk about that as well. It's an interesting point because, uh, you know, you, you always think people add capacity and they never shrink, but sometimes shrinking is in interesting as well. Uh, decommissioning of old hardware and adding new hardware is becoming very commonplace these days because life of, you know, generation of hardware is about 18 to 24 months, and people want to kind of keep up to speed. Um, uh, the other aspect is about uh, data placement. Uh, more than just data placement, how resources are placed. And uh, we'll again talk about that. And that's a very fundamental concept for us about how we arbitrage price performance. About load balancing, uh, this is part of our the edge computing aspect of the system. So we make some real-time decisions on how to kind of move stuff around to give you the, the service levels that we guaranteed. Um, about tenancy and resource isolation, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. Because once you have multiple applications, multiple users, multiple tenants on one infrastructure, you will want to divvy it up. You don't want one person to block another person. Right. And, uh, and our, our mantra is all about API first programmability, right? So everything we do, you know, uh, we show you on the UI, uh, is all API. Can, we have all the capabilities on the API, and probably API is a lot more richer than what we show you on the UI. Uh, extremely flexible, and that's one of the reasons why we can plug into all these orchestrators very seamlessly, uh, because we have extreme control through the API. 
So, mm -hmm. so quick question. Sure. So I'm, I'm obviously I'm pretty familiar with SolidFire and how they do their arch architecture. Are you guys doing something similar where it, a LUN is married to a particular node only in, in the cluster, or is it striped wholly across multiple nodes? From it a, is distributed across multiple nodes. Okay. So it is distributed across a select set of nodes. We don't do a random hash. Uh, we do a policy-defined placement, and that's kind of one of the key aspects. And the reason why that is interesting is uh, because we have this heterogeneity of nodes. You know, no two media types these days are similar. You can have, uh, you know, uh, media which uh, you can have a hard drive, you can have a SSD flash, you can have, you know, future very high performance flash, and you want to arbitrage and take advantage of. So it. this is not an all flash only platform. We we do have customers who use us as an all flash only product but we have a lot more customers using as a heterogeneous environment. Some hybrid nodes and some flash. Okay, so when, yeah, so when we're saying data placement, it could be on a hybrid portion of the same Absolutely. cluster? Absolutely. And In all fact, flash portion of the same cluster? One of the, one, of the, one of the unique aspects is you can have your first replica of a volume on flash, and your second and tertiary replica is on hybrid. So you, know, you can take advantage of the price points, right? Maybe all flash. If it's an all flash volume, it would have been okay. three dollars a gig. By replica, you mean like the? Is it like a failure copy or yes. snapshot? Yeah, failure copy. Okay. Yeah. So, so, sorry. Just just to dive deeper into Adam's question, because in reference to SolidFire and SolidFire, the data is spread across all the nodes. It's the metadata, you know. A so <clears throat> the. The problem with that approach is performance for any single presented volume As a match. is limited by the performance of the metadata engine that owns that volume. The owner. Is that a, is that a distributed process in Dayterra? Yeah, so both aspects are distributed. Uh, the target ports, which is where we advertise the iSCSI IP address from a node, it is, it is initially tied to a particular node, but it's a virtual IP address. So based on, like I said, we do this active uh, load balancing of the system. So let's hypothetically say that you created, you know, 20 LUNs on uh, on a 10 node cluster. No, no, no let's, let's hammered. Let's talk about one LUN. Yeah. That because if I've got 20, you know, if I've got a large number of LUNs, everything evens out. The, yes. the, the problem that we're looking at is the the concentration problem. Mm -hmm. So I think the easiest way. Of so so is the the real question is. Do you do iSCSI redirects on a volume level or on an LBA range level? So, so thanks, Howard. It's, it's a good question. So fundamentally, we've, we've bifurcated, split the metadata between cluster level uh, volume placement policy, and then all of the file system metadata is node local. So every single node is managing its own metadata for where those blocks are. But the volume is distributed across multiple nodes. At the cluster level. At the cluster level. But when the data hits a node, it deals with its local metadata. Okay. Did you, so, did you mention deduplication or compression? Yeah, we have compression in the system. Just compression. Uh, dedupe is you know, one of is the features. Is that globally across the entire cluster, cluster or lo no local to the data? That's compression is on, on that data set. Okay. It's local. It's, it's local. local. Yeah, compression is inherently uh, limited scope. So I, make, I have an application making 70 simultaneous read requests for various blocks within one volume. They do that to the virtual IP address. Yes. All of those requests get handled by one by whichever node claimed the virtual IP address for that set of flows. That's correct. Um, and then those requests get distributed to nodes, and the data comes back up through the node. Yes. That's why we have a front end and a back end network. Okay. Solidfire, isn't it? No. It, Solidfire uses I uses SCSI redirects. You you go to the virtual IP address, and then iSCSI has a mechanism where it says that LUN is owned it's by owned that by node and, that's and redirects it, yeah. the connection yeah. and the yeah. request gets resent. But still all the actions come through one. Yeah, I think, I think there, we support iSCSI redirects as well for certain use cases. And it's, iSCSI redirect is a feature that we enable for, especially some orchestrators like CloudStack, for example, it's where it depends on iSCSI redirect to work well. Yeah. But, but, but it's not the basis of, of how no. you, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You so have a connection, it's on a particular target, the target IP address is, is associated with a particular target. Unless that, tar that particular node is stressed, when things have to get rebalanced, it moves out. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, I think we've reached the, the proof is in the pudding and we got to test it. Yeah, so Nick, Nick will go into this in, in depth. So. Yeah, a bit more detail, yeah. Yeah, well, you know there's no such thing as too much detail for us. <laughs> Right. So just to, you know, historically, what from a storage system perspective, we were looking at as performance and capacity, uh, two basic metrics, you know, customers were buying. 
Another an interesting aspect, especially in the cloud, is the working set size. And, and the reason why that is interesting is, obviously, you can throw a flash you know, storage solution for every problem, and you won't go wrong, except that it's going to be expensive. Uh, that's, what, that's the reason why we have this notion of the more you understand the application, the more you want to kind of distribute, uh, take advantage of the media and, and this resource underneath, you can distribute your workloads accordingly. And, and again, this might, might not be a perfect fit. I'm just taking an example space here. You know, maybe your file systems and test and dev workloads are going to work, work on a very small working set, but require really high performance. The second aspect could be, you know, there are all these long tail workloads, which, you know, working set is somewhere in the medium range. They don't also care about a lot of performance. So, you know, you might not want to have the highest performance storage device or, you know, the highest working set capable storage device. And then you have those cases, you know, especially your databases, which probably need, are working on a very large working set and need crazy high performance. And maybe Flash is the right, right solution for that. And, and what we do is we have the ability to use the hybrid flash nodes for certain use cases or uh, and, and all flash nodes for certain use cases. And again, all of this is in one cluster. Uh, you can have you know, a replica, primary replica on flash and subsequent replicas on hybrid. So you can mix and match. We give you extreme flexibility in how you want to take care, care of. You know. When you're talking about working set here, you're actually talking about the IO operation to block space yes. kind of thing. You're not yeah. talking about data cache or anything like that. No, no. Okay. Right, so. <coughs> and, and those uh, data location Details are all about profile gen. Yeah, so that's a good question. So we have a lot of this information. So one of the big problems is historically storage devices never give you insight into the product itself. Uh, in our cloud analytics tool, you see that we give you tremendous insight on the product. We'll give you what are the cache hit ratios, what's the front end bandwidth, what's the back end bandwidth, how much times are we fetching data from another node. We give you all of this information, right? So that's one, one piece is for us to start tune, tune, tuning the system to make it a lot more effective, but also as a customer, you're just a lot more informed on how your workloads are. We give you IO profiles, what is IO sizes, give you all sorts of information, right? More information than you probably can digest. But to be precise, it's the backend storage specific information as opposed to application or file type. We give you the application I.O. patterns as well. We'll tell you this, uh, this application did, you know, X amount of 4K IOPS, X amount of 8K IOPS. We give you all sorts of information that you can use. How does it know the application? Is it, does it integrate with the application of our agents or? So based on the volume that is mounted for, for that particular application. So we'll give you a volume level information. Maybe that's the way of putting it. Okay. So it's not like, um, for example, um, what was that storage company? Um, um, Coesic, for example, that gives you like very low level specification uh, analytics about the actual data itself that sits inside the... You know, um, so we're not file aware, so we are block aware. So yeah. we give you block level Block level details, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. So let me, let me just uh, talk about the system itself. Uh, like I think we talked about, it's a heterogeneous uh, configuration, mix and match of all flash and hybrid uh, nodes. You know, it's, uh, you, you know, I have a bunch of blue for hybrid and I'm gonna use red for flash. There's nothing political about this. Uh, we, we, you know, you have, you, you, you want capacity, you get hybrid nodes. You know, we have a couple of configurations that we default ship. Again, we are very flexible, depends upon what the customer has. Um, you can scale your capacity as you add nodes. You can also have you know, flash nodes and get a different performance profile to capacity. Or you can have a combination of, and we give you a wide aperture of price performance. And this is important because you don't know what type of applications you're going to onboard in your cluster, in your, in our, in your cloud environment, and you want to have the ability to offer multiple service levels. Right? Uh, you can obviously, like we talked about, you can add nodes, decommission nodes, reconfigure nodes, uh, et cetera. Uh, we support a lot of online operations. You can, again, do all of this stuff online. We can expand a volume, volume online. We can reconfigure. Uh, you know, we, we give you a lot of capabilities on the cluster itself. And hypothetically speaking, if there was a new faster media type which shows up in the market and that we build a box around that, it just gives you a wider price performance ratio, right? If you need super low latency, but you can afford to spend a few more dollars on per gig, you know, that you have a configuration there that you can consume as well. So are these reference architectures or just slap a bunch of disks in a series of servers? Yeah, we have a HCL, hardware compatibility disk. Mm -hmm. So we have reference configurations. Uh, like I said, we offer a couple of appliances ourselves if customers want to procure that. Super uh, or if you know, customers want to build their own configurations, we have reference configurations. So one of the things that you... It, it, uh, the, the first note you have here is the heterogeneous node configuration. So it sounds to me that one of the 
things you're going to market with as an idea is that you can have lots of different configurations of storage and put them all together into a big cluster. Yes. What we've been hearing from multiple people, and there's a, the, the Open 19 we've been hearing about yesterday, is that the move is to really go to hom hom homogenous server infrastructures for uh, you know, scalable and efficient and cost effective and all that kind of management and stuff like that. So if you have a customer who's hooked on that concept, of the hum, hum, is it, does that detract from your value proposition? No, absolutely not. I mean, homogeneous is all the better. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, reality is this. I've uh, been in the data center space for 20 years. I've never seen one customer have homogeneous hardware in a data center ever. They always want to have everything common, but they always buy stuff every six months, and every six months something new shows up, and they buy always the new stuff. So they're going to have a diverse set of... Uh, sounds like that's changing. It sounds like that, that is... I mean, and that's, that's perfect. That's what we've been that. hearing. Well, find a couple of things. First of all, that's about the guys who put 5,000 servers in... Well, they're trying at, to get other people to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, it, it. but it's designed... But, but Open19 was about we put a whole row of racks in mm -hmm. on a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that home, and that, that... But that's a bad, but they, it becomes a best practice that filters down. Yeah, but, there's, okay. but, the, but the homogeneity there, they're still saying it's a server, not it's a server with the same SSDs and the same hard drives. Because mm -hmm. just in Open19, there were four sizes of servers. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, you know, there, it's let's get rid of the checkpoint appliance that we have to have two of because yeah, if well, it no breaks... Yeah, no appliance is right, right. right. Yeah. And, and frankly, uh, media, right, especially flash media is tracking your, you know, your cell phone life, right, it's 12 months. Every 12 months you're getting a new generation of media uh, with dramatically different profile in terms of price and performance to some mm -hmm. extent as well, right? So very rarely are you going to find one data center with completely homogeneous stuff. And uh, if I may add to that real quick, uh, in some customers that we've had, they actually brought up a similar point that they want to standardize on a few SKUs. Now, uh, that's a point in time standardization. Of course, over time that evolves. So now you get back on these obsolescence cycles, which is uh, inherently not good, especially for data. And secondly, whenever we tell them then that that's you know, a little bit of hardware-centric perspective, <coughs> don't worry about this because we can carve out the specific needs for your applications out of a larger range, evolving range of hardware, okay, where you don't need to be that prescriptive, uh, they actually like that a lot, okay, because it's a sort of more a software-defined approach versus a hardware-centric thinking that, that we're seeing at that point, Thank okay? You. And I thought we were in trouble when the boss took the microphone. <laughs> Um, the other part of it, like I think, which dovetails very nicely with the previous uh, capability, is this notion of, you know, how we policy base place resources. I mean, not just data, but also target ports and the like. And you're going to have uh, multiple service levels, right? You're building a cloud. You're going to house multiple applications, multiple users with different price point requirements, different performance requirements. So the idea is, you know, based on IOPS, latency, bandwidth, durability, etc., you can define multiple service levels. I mean, you can have a customer who wants extreme uh, you know, durability and is willing to pay you, what, you know, what's required with very high ops, low latency requirements, and you can have a five-way replication, so you can handle like you know, three node failure, four node failure situations, right? And then you can have a, a case where a customer just wants cheap and deep storage with you know, some amount of durability, doesn't really care about IOPS um, and the like. And, and most modern workloads are not as IOP bound, they're actually bandwidth bound because most of the data, most of the modern data stacks do large block reads and writes typically. And you know, you want to license it maybe like by bandwidth. And we give you the ability to do that as well. So these are all just so as a as a provider, you can just carve out multiple service levels uh, and you know charge them appropriately. It's extremely flexible from that perspective. I will show you kind of examples on that as well. The other aspect which I talked I touched upon earlier is this notion of template-based deployment. Um, again, you know, you could offer service levels, or you can offer services itself. Right? You can offer a MySQL service with a different definition. Maybe for MySQL for dev with the definition, on MySQL for production with a different def definition. I will show you in the container world, it becomes really interesting because there's a direct correlation to a container to an application and becomes a bit more interesting. But even otherwise, right? You can give your developers a MySQL template. He doesn't have to understand anything about what's the performance I have to configure, what's IOPS I have to configure, any of these nuances. All he's a, he's, he's a developer is just consuming some template. And you know what? He, install, he instantiates 10, 15 instances of these. And then let's say um, in the next one fine day, you figure, you know, if I change the latency profile by 5%, I get 30% more performance. You can just tweak the template 
and we automatically percolate that change to all the instances. And that's an extremely powerful construct because as a developer, I don't have to understand any of this stuff. I want the, my infrastructure owner to take care of that, right? So we really decouple that part of it. And that so, also- so, so you're actually modifying the, the, I'll call it the provision template rather than a quality of service for the volume or something like that? Yeah, so you, you, when you change the parameters of the template, we percolate the, the so think of it as a bounded uh, instance to the template. So every right. instance or every um, mm -hmm. volume resource that you provision out of the template is bound to the definition of this uh, template. In real time? In real time. Yeah. And I think Bill is going to cover that as well in a, in a container case, right? So I think that's, uh, that's one of the big aspects of it, right? Not just historically, like we know of service levels as volumes and QoS, but a bit more richer profile than that. Uh, other part we have noticed, I'll touch upon this very briefly, not spend too much time, but is this notion of, you know, I talked about infrastructure awareness. The more we understand infrastructure, the, the better we behave. And one of the key aspects we've seen is most of these modern data centers uh, want to move away from L2 boundaries to be, should I say, data center should, is their failure domain. It's no longer a rack to be a failure domain. And they, they, they want a flat L3 network, and they want resources to spread all be spread out all over the data center and things to be extremely fluid. Uh, so we participate in the L3 fabric, and uh, we, like hypothetically speaking, you have a Dekera node here which fails. Uh, we participate in this L3 fabric, and let's say this IP address moves to a different track. We advertise it through the route reflector and give the flexibility for the client to communicate to that IP address. So extremely transparent, the same look and feel as what you saw in L2, area, L2 domain, but in a very distributed in a data center level, right? So we take advantage of um, the whole you know, typically most modern data centers use BGP or OSPF, and we participate in, in their auto advertisement as part of that uh, protocol. The second, second part of it is also this notion of failure domain. So we talked about how we place data. The more, again, the more we understand uh, the, the, the topology, the better we place data. So if we, we try to understand uh, the L2, for example, if it's L2 network, we understand uh, which racks we are part of. And then we make sure the replicas are spread across multiple racks, right? So if a rack goes down, that's not your failure domain. So to tie what I said earlier, right? So the more we understand the infrastructure, because we see the network to be our backplane. So the more we understand the back, the more we understand the network, the better we can use the backplane. Uh, we try to understand the application, like I talked about. The templates give us a lot of hints on what the application behavior is, and we also collect a lot of information on the profile itself uh, in the cloud portal. We'll talk about that. And for us, an, an x86 server is an x86 server with some media capability, right? Every x86 server that joins a cluster kind of self-describes what its capabilities are. We kind of consume those capabilities and advertise it. So it's a pool of resources that gets advertised uh, to the cluster, and the cluster starts to see how can I use these resources uh, based on application and infrastructure, right? Uh, the, the, the system itself is uh, failure handling is very, it's, it's, for us, it's a node failure, drive failure, uh, link failure, and because of that node is offline, the behavior is fairly similar. And, and Nick is gonna double click on how failure handling and, and node addition is, is done. Uh, very seamless mesh rebuilds, very fast. The larger the cluster, things are faster, right? Very simple. Um, tenancy, um, like I said, we have, you know, tenancy could be Multiple applications, multiple users, multiple real tenants, multiple customers, right? All sharing same infrastructure. Or it could be multiple orchestration stacks sharing, sharing the same infrastructure. Uh, we can partition and, and do resource isolation appropriately, visibility appropriately. I will show an example where we have running, I think, three environments and, and, and live show this, how we do, we do this. You can obviously, uh, we do noisy neighbor uh, isolation through QoS controls. And like I said, these days, uh, as much as IOPS is interesting, bandwidth is equally interesting as well. So we give you controls on both, both the vectors. And we also give you controls on not just total, but also read write, because you know, applications have uh, interesting requirements. And the more you, know, you have control of that, the better a service provider can you know, offer the right service levels. Uh, we can also, we also give this notion of IP pool block. So each orchestration stack, or each application, or each user can have their own IP blocks for their, to manage their resources uh, from, a, from a client perspective. Um, we can also do isolation through VLAN tagging. I mean, you know, traditional methods that uh, service providers are using currently for, uh, for isolation. We do all of the network isolation capabilities as well. 
So um, micro segmentation at the tenant and application level. So um, I could be a specific tenant, like a service provider, customer, or something like that. And I have separate applications within that environment. Uh, each could have its own segment for QoS and absolutely that sort of absolutely. stuff. You can do it uh, by IP blocks. You can do it by like a tenant definition on a system itself. Uh, you can do it by volume. I mean, you can do it in multiple ways. That's why I said, for us, a tenant really means it could be an application, it could be a user, it could be a tenant in its classic sense. Um, I think this one is uh, just uh, like you pointed out earlier, uh, our system is designed with the API first approach. So everything in the system is the API controllable. The UI is built on this API. Obviously, the UI doesn't use all of the capabilities, right? We have a, fun fa function, a factor of it, which is short, but not all of it. Um, we obviously, will, we have uh, the, the benefit of extremely programmable infrastructure is that we can write plugins to all these frameworks very seamlessly. Frankly, when we started the company, containers were not mainstream, but we were one of the first ones to build a very deep Kubernetes plugin with a flex volume framework, right? So it's, uh, it's an extremely programmable infrastructure that makes it very easy to kind of control every aspect of the system. Um, so this is my last slide. Uh, again, I, like I said, this is a very core aspect of the product. Obviously, it's not on the premise, it's off the premise. Uh, this is what we use a lot for support offload, for operations offload. We give a lot of insights to the customer and the like. So the first aspect of it is there's a lot of telemetry that we collect and display. So there's a visualization and dashboard aspect of this. Uh, again, it's configurable, so some customers want to see more information and some customers want to see less information. It's all configurable. You can pick and choose what are the aspects you really care about. So it helps you with the continuous monitoring aspect. People like to see, we have a bunch of customers who have three, four data centers and they want to have one visualized dashboard and they use that as well. Uh, so one me, aspect. Uh, can you go back to the prior slide just for a second? You mentioned something here about Docker support. Yes. Do you support Docker? Yes. Cloud volume? I mean, Buy and plug in because yes. I didn't see it. Your your plug in on the Docker official list here. We we haven't. Uh, I think we as part of the new launch we did not announce it, but we do have a Docker volume plug in. It's in GitHub. Yeah. Okay. So it's not it's just not official yet or something like that. There's a certification process. I think we'll be Has, out. In hasn't that. been blessed by the Pope yet. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, we have a we have a Kubernetes uh, plug in, Docker plug in, and a Mesos plug in. And, and Kubernetes and Docker are fairly similar, and just the API structure is minor different, yeah. Um, so just to continue this, the other aspect is performance insights. Like I said, uh, we obviously give system level information, like network behavior, front end, back end, et cetera, but we also give you a no deep insights, like what is the cache hit ratios, you know, what's the read from tier zero, what's the read from tier one, all the gory details. Obviously, storage admins like to see this uh, information. Um, and you know you can also slice it by an application. See what is the volume performance? What is what is the I/O characteristics on a volume? You know can translate to that to an application. So it's just just a lot more information on how you use it. We use it internally to start modeling the environment as well, right? The other aspect is uh, capacity. You know one of the things uh, sales obviously likes to see is how is the customer using the system? Are they hitting you know like a 70, 80 percent capacity limit? And can I call up? Call them up, but the idea is, you know, we give you a lot of uh, in insights into how the application is using, what is the behavior, uh, what is the trend based on past behavior, uh, based on some of the insights we build on top of that. So um, again, a lot of rich information for the customer and uh, infrastructure. You know, things always break. We expect commodity x86 servers to break, drives to fail, network links to go down, and uh, we obviously uh, monitor that. We do use uh, some predictive services on top of it to see, because we have a global view of our customers, we start to see, are there some consistent trends? Uh, what's the profile? And uh, we kind of feed that. We have an alerting system as well, so customers will get information of if things are going to break, if you know NTP server is down, stuff like that, right? We kind of factor all that information in and uh, communicate. 